All this is Dr. Mubin Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. In the talk today, we'll talk about horses and Nemo, you know, the finding Nemo, the fish, and other such things. And in this process, we'll discuss ashwagandha. This is a uh, an Indian and African herb that has been used for about 3,000 years. Um, after reading the literature, I have mixed feelings about it. I have not used it for myself. However, this topic was very much requested. So let's look at this topic. It is actually fascinating to look at this herb and how it works. I'm only going to take one part or one kind of its action today, and that is the inflammation. Although its primary use is for stress relief and for adaptogenic behavior, meaning it allows a person not to stress out because of something that is bothering them. For example, let's say stress of age, stress of disease, or other stresses, it helps them adapt. Why I said I have mixed feelings is that I do not see strong studies for this. So from a studies point of view, from an evidence point of view, I see mostly in vitro studies or mouse models. However, be uh, aware that it has been used in India. India is a very large population. It has been used there for 3,000 years. My own family, uh, of course, we are from Pakistan, but our ancestors were in combined Indian um, continent. And my maternal side practiced local medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, for 400 years. And these uh, kind of herbs are, of course, part of that process of practicing. So let's start. I have drawn some very cool cartoons for you today as well. So I hope you like them. Uh, so first of all, this is drbean.com. In the description of this video, there is a um, link to get access to drbean.com. We have finally reached a point that our courses page has become ready now. All descriptions are correct and all prices are final. Monday, we would launch this. So this one, this page will be uh, changed on Monday to move the price from 67 to 97. And then a week later, that will be retired as well. And we will only be offering the courses. So with this, if you wanted to take advantage of that, you can. This gives you access to everything. Once we go towards the courses, you continue to be grandfathered in the system. So with this, here are some of the references. And as I have always done with the herbs, I try to put the side effects first so that you are aware of what are the contraindications because many of the articles that talk about some herbs, they do not usually put the side effects. Having said that, I, I know that you are aware that side effects for every medicine are studied in pharmacology. Every medicine has side effects. That doesn't mean that medicine is not used. Usually the dosage that is used for a drug and the frequency of the use provides us the best um, effect with least side effects. The dosage for this is 1000 milligram. And let me show you some of the side effects and contraindication. And then we look at the anti-inflammatory mechanism. There are many people who use it on daily basis. I have seen many long COVID patients using it and feeling better. And then uh, there are some for whom it does not work very well. Uh, so ashwagandha here, this is Merck Manual, is a small evergreen shrub that grows in India, Middle East, and Africa. The botanical name is this. I want to go to the, uh, the side effects. So ashwagandha is probably unsafe for pregnant women because it might increase the risk of miscarriage. Whether nursing mothers should take it or not, we do not know because there are no studies for uh, nursing mothers. And it can irritate digestive tract in some people. The drug interactions, remember that it is 
it affects on the neurological system it affects on the immune system it actually boosts so when you talk about boosting the immune system this is a drug that actually boosts it it makes the innate arm a little more active and more strong if we can use that as a as a flexible medical term so uh, ashwagandha might lower blood sugar levels and thus make it unsafe to use with anti hyperglycemics then it, it it can lower blood pressure as well so be careful to use it with anti hypertensives then it seems to change the immune system's activity and it might interfere with those immune system drugs that are suppressing the immune system so uh, drug is let's say we are taking drugs to suppress immune system and then we take ashwagandha it can reduce their activity by boosting the immune system and those uh, cool beans who have been here with me for a long time they know that i do not like to use the word boosting because boosting actually means moving the immune system above and beyond its normal expected behavior however this drug actually does boost the immune system and because of that drugs like cyclosporines or mycophenolate etc prednisolones it does not work very well with them or should not be taken it can shave off some of their effect ashwagandha might take might make people drowsy or sleepy because it does have an effect on the brain and calming effect one part of that side effect could be sleepiness uh, some combining sedative hypnotic drugs used to help with the sleep ashwagandha might take make people too sleepy in them ashwagandha may increase thyroid hormone levels so doctors carefully monitor the thyroid functions so merck manual says no recommendation they don't think it is useful but that is merck manual uh, take that with a grain of salt um this is webmd and what is important here is the dosing so if you see here webmd says ashwagandha has most often been used by adults in doses up to 1000 mg daily for up to 12 weeks speak with a healthcare doctor so more than 12 weeks or 3 months usage there are not much studies once again people have been using it for a long time there are all of these links are present in the description of this video this is the study this is 2023 in pharmaceutics and this study was uh, 6 february 2023 is when it was received and now it is accepted in 20 march 2023 and published on 24 march so it's a very recent uh, write up this study is what i'm going to take one part at a time and discuss if you would like more discussions about ashwagandha if there isn't much interest then i would leave it after this discussion So today I'm going to talk about anti-inflammatory but there are other effects here as well. With this I have some other um links in the description as well that would help you see or read various components of ashwagandha. With this I'm going to now go to this sometimes i forgot to re- forget to reset it so these are gifts for humanity and they're continuing this is what we're talking about ashwagandha it is an it is called indian ginseng ginseng it is called indian winter cherry it is not actually the winter cherry it is just called indian winter cherry it is called vitinia sluggard or vitinia somnifera the root is the actual um component that is used for medical purposes or medicinal purposes ashwa so i do not know how to pronounce it very well i'm not from india so i do not know exactly how to pronounce it uh, ashwa means horse <laughs> and this is my depiction of horse whatever it means uh, i know that the nose is a little crooked but anyways that is horse and ganda uh, means fragrance so its root has that fragrance of the plants because of flavonoids in them and so it is horse and fragrance uh, remember this that wherever we have flavonoids and flavonols 
there is going to be stress reduction. Uh, remember that study from Japan where they sent out a few people to forest and another few people to Tokyo and they gave the people going to Tokyo, they gave them money to party and re relax. And the people who went to forest, they were also asked to relax and have fun. When they came back, they thought that people who went to Tokyo, they would have better uh, relaxation and they would be in a better shape compared to those who went to the jungle. And it turned out that because of the phantom sites, because of the phytochemicals and the fragrance in the jungle or the forest, the people who went to the forest, they had lower uh, stress hormones, lower cortisol levels, lower norepinephrine, epinephrine levels, and they had a higher uh, volume or concentration or count of natural killer cells. So their immune system was performing better and their stress hormones were performing meaning going down. On the other hand, the people who went to Tokyo, they did not have this change, although they were also relaxed and having fun. So that means that if you are near plants, that actually relaxes you more and that boosts your immune system. So this is a plant as well with its fragrance. Whenever you have a plant's fragrance, that means you are actually uh, inhaling the flavonols and flavonoids, flavonoids actually. So that is ashwagandha. So areas of study, there are many areas in which it has been studied nowadays for neuroprotection, sedative effect, adaptogenic effect, as I said before, sleep, anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, cardioprotective, anti-diabetic, then possible reproductive outcomes and hormone modulations. <laughs> Today, I tried to write it in my cursive handwriting and you can see it is so difficult to read even I cannot read my own handwriting and it is yet a clean hand, handwriting. Anyways, uh, active components. So there are many phytochemicals that are present. It's a plant, right? So it is going to have phytochemicals or plant chemicals in it. The important ones are vitanolides and alkaloids. And there are, for example, vitanolides are vitanofurin A, vitanolides A to Y, vitanone, and so on. Similarly, there are alkaloids as well, vitanin, somniferin, somnin, etc. It has flavonoids too, and these are the kind of flavonoids that are present. So it has good chemicals that are present in it. Now I'm going to go to anti-inflammatory effect. This is where we'll talk. We have already talked about horse. I promised you that we'll talk about horse. I just hope that CDC does not put a tweet out tomorrow that you are not a horse, so don't take flavonols or, or ashwagandha. But now I'm going to talk about Nemo as well. <laughs> so we're going to see if we can find Nemo. So anti-inflammatory effect. So what it does is basically it affects the nuclear factor kappa B pathway. So before I go and discuss one of the pathways, just one. There are actually many pathways. I'm only gonna talk about one to kind of make a point here. The nuclear factor kappa B pathway is usually said to be the cell survival pathway. The mechanisms that are orchestrated inside a cell, imagine for a second the gears turning in the cell. They become active in this pathway, nuclear factor kappa B pathway, either because of stressors outside of the cell, for example, presence of the pathogens, presence of bacteria, presence of viruses, presence of toxins, presence of foreign material that the cell doesn't like, those can activate uh, pathogen recognition receptors or PRR. One important one is called tall like receptor or TLR4. And that inside is connected with nuclear factor kappa B gears of the system and that produces an inflammatory response from the cell. So it's a survival behavior. Similarly, within the cell as well and surrounding the cell, there may be an absence of the foreign material, but still stressors on the cell, for example, extraordinary stretch or skew of the cell 
or the pH is different or the oxygen levels are not correct. So other stressors of the cell can also cause nuclear factor kappa B to become active. This is why we say that nuclear factor kappa B system can become activated as a canonical system or canonical pathway, which means the pathogen comes in or foreign material comes in or some some offending agent from outside is introduced in our body and our body is now going to respond with the survival instinct or survival mechanism and not just the instinct but also the molecules and that will be the canonical nuclear factor kappa b pathway the non-canonical pathway is where the body and the cells are activating this pathway nuclear factor kappa b but for uh, internal stressors so how does it work let's start from here and actually before my diagram i want to show you to if you go to this um, link this is a diagram where the this part here is a nuclear factor kappa b this p50 and p65 are actually the ones and you can see that there are many pathways that would activate it i am only going to talk about these two pathways and still within this i'm only going to talk about this one area this one i'm i'm going to remove or ignore tram i'm going to ignore all of this as well but i want to make sure that it is in front of you that there are more ways to activate the nuclear factor kappa b the point i'm making is ashwagandha actually modulates this pathway and suppresses it so that the inflammatory state is reduced when this state is taken up in the brain then the brain's inflammatory state responds by gliosis gliosis is overproduction of the brain's tissue cells which are going to respond with inflammation and ashwagandha suppresses that too because of that it can in theory from a mechanism point of view reduce brain's inflammation and also reduce inflammation in the body i think this is why it may have been um, for some long COVID patients who've been saying that hey when i take ashwagandha that allows me to number one be relaxed and number two my neurological symptoms improve so maybe these are the com combinations so back here Imagine that in here, this is all a cell inside. This is the cell membrane. On the membrane, we have tall-like receptor four, and we also have interleukin receptor. So the cells respond to interleukins. This is interleukin one receptor that also activates the nuclear factor kappa B, and tall-like receptor four that would uh, that would identify some pathogen in the environment. Now, if we go in here the tall like receptor 4 on the inside of the cell it is connected to a couple of proteins called tirap and tram i am going to go this pathway as i said tirap when become active how when we have something here let's say a pathogen a gram negative bacteria lipopolysaccharide some toxins on the bacteria they are here tall like receptor 4 becomes active when it becomes active it activates both of them i'm only going to be here so let's say tirap becomes active when that becomes active it activates another protein called my d88 <laughs> my d88 so my d88 so today your, your takeaway are going to be two basic things. One is ashwagandha can be used to reduce inflammation in the brain and in the tissues. And second is the, the pathway that it uses is nuclear factor kappa B pathway. It suppresses that. So now there are just some fun characters. My D88 protein, when that becomes activated, it causes another set of proteins which are called IRAK4 and IRAK1. It activates them or we use also the term it recruits them it activates them it brings them in action so it recruits them with the irak it is another protein attached to them called traf6 this protein once it is activated what it does is there is another complex of three proteins actually this complex of two proteins called tab two three and take one tab take so we are we are getting near a fish so you open up a tab in your in your restaurant and 
take one fish. So tab two, three and take one. When these become activated or tag one, not take. When these become activated, what they do is there is another protein called Nemo. When they will become, these two guys will become active, they will activate Nemo. Now, here is an interesting thing. When Nemo is activated, there is ubiquitination of Nemo. What does that mean? Nemo will be destroyed. Ubiquitination inside our cells mean, and I've done a complete discussion about ubiquitination and autophagy in terms of intermittent fasting mechanisms. In the ubiquitination, our cells can try to destroy proteins in two ways. It can destroy proteins as a regular mechanism, which you would see here. For example, Nemo will be destroyed as a normal function of the cell. This is like opening a door. So the cell would not open the door. It would just destroy the door. But that doesn't mean there is a disaster happening. That simply means that is a function. It is trying to open a door inside and it broke it to open it. Then, so this would be called autophagy, uh, sorry, ubiquitination. Ubiquitination does not cause alarm in the cell that proteins are breaking. This is a normal mechanism. The other one is that we have done autophagy, which can pick up the raw material or the, or the bad, tangled, D-shaped, denatured proteins and break them down, and that actually causes alert as well. So back here, the Nemo protein gets ubiquin ubiquitinated. That means it gets marked to be destroyed. So, of course, it then gets destroyed. When it gets destroyed, then this TAC1, <laughs> this is such a funny story, this TAC1 then sneaks beyond the Nemo and goes and connects with this pathway. Do you see? There are two proteins here. Let me make them bigger. There are two proteins. This is IKKB and this is IKK alpha. And do you see this little TAC has snuck in and now it is phosphorylating. Phosphorylating means putting a phosphate. Many times when we are activating a protein in our cells, we put a phosphate on them. We give them currency. We give them money to become active. So here, TAC1 has come in near IKK alpha and beta, and it is now phosphorylating IKK beta. That phosphorylation would activate this one, IKK beta, which in turn will take a phosphate and phosphorylate this little guy. So do you see that they are in turn phosphorylating and activating each other? Some of them are just going poof. They are disappearing like Nemo. So if this was the movie Finding Nemo, you will not find Nemo because Nemo would get destroyed. So here, IKK beta, when that becomes active, it would phosphorylate this IK beta alpha. This guy, this little thing here where there is a protein, you can see probably that this little protein is holding on to two baby proteins. This is a very common pattern in our cells where a protein protects the other protein and prevents it from functioning by hugging it and binding with it. So imagine that in your home, there is a refrigerator. You do not want the refrigerator to be opened. There is a delicious cake in there, <laughs> yummy cake. So what you do is you go and hug the refrigerator. So now the refrigerator is not accessible to others because you are hugging it or you are sequestering it. That is what's happening here. This little protein is called IK beta alpha or IKK. It is sequestering or binding with two more proteins called P50 and P65. This whole complex together is the nuclear factor kappa B complex. In this complex, one protein is the binding protein to protect these two active ones. These two little baby proteins are actually the active ones. They are protected by this guy. And why do you think we are protecting them? Very simple. These two proteins are the ones that would cause the cell to produce inflammatory mediators. So if you let them be 
free, like little naughty children in the cell, they're going to run in the nucleus and ask the nucleus to make inflammatory proteins. We don't want them to do that. So what do we do? We bind them to this bigger mommy protein. So now this complex is present and when IKK beta here becomes active, it will attach a phosphate to this proteins. When this protein gets the phosphate attached to it, that causes this protein to become destroyed or degraded by ubiquitination. When this gets, so who got destroyed here? Nemo and IKK. When that gets destroyed, guess what proteins become free? The P50 and P65 become free. These are the actual active nuclear factor kappa B transcripting proteins. Why do we call them transcripting proteins? Because they would go in the nucleus, they will bind with the DNA, and they would open up the DNA for transcription or gene expression. So as soon as this mother protein got destroyed or ubiquitinated, these two children protein became free. They ran into the nucleus and they bound to their corresponding genes. And once they got bound there, we would say gene promotion. They will promote the gene now to become expressive. So gene will open up and the messenger RNA will be produced. This messenger RNA will then come out of the cell and will attach with the ribosome, with the Golgi apparatus, and it would, uh, so smooth and uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum would be the one with the ribosome. That would then produce the actual proteins that are the responsive proteins and various kind of inflammatory proteins will be produced. Now, various pathways produce some more than the others. For example, the, the tall like receptor pathway produces these ones more compared to the other pathways that might produce these more. But in any event, when the ashwagandha is given and it is modulating the nuclear factor kappa B pathway, all of these can be reduced. What are these? Interleukin-12, pro-inflammatory. Interleukin-6, quite pro-inflammatory. Actually, interleukin-6 blockers are given all the time for controlling the inflammation. Interleukin-8, tumor necrosis factor alpha. Interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-1, uh, sorry, 6. And then I wrote six here as well, nitric oxide stress um, enzymes as well that will produce the reactive oxygen species, reactive nitric oxide species. So these would all start going down. The result of that is that the inflammation will go down. And now just very quickly, this is the mechanism. I just explained one tiny part of this whole thing. Now, if I go back here to this study, in this study, um, I'm not going to read the whole paragraph, but this is the section for, okay, so I lost the section, one second. Here. So this is the anti-inflammatory section. Here, all of these color variations that I have are because they have various in vitro or mouse model studies in which they said that this study was done and that study showed the modulation of these inflammatory mediators that it just showed. And I showed you the pathway for how these get modulated. So this is the discussion. Thank you very much for listening in. Um, Take advantage of this awesomely low price for Dr. Bean because on Monday we would stop this and we would change this to 97 and then we'll remove it and go back to courses or go to courses. Uh, please like, subscribe and share. If you would like to support this work, there are links in the description. You can support that as well. And um, I hope you like the cartoons today as well with this. Thank you very much. I'll see you tomorrow.